Hey everyone, so and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm here to talk about the books that I've read in October and November. These two months were definitely not as successful in terms of the number of books I've read. It is something that cannot be said about the quality of the books that I've read because I actually had a lot of really good reads that I gave quite high ratings. So without further ado, let me just talk about them. The first book that I want to talk about is The Bone Season by Samantha Shannon. I have the physical book on my shelf, but I'm just too lazy to um, get my ass up off the couch. The Bone Season was absolutely incredible. And I can't believe I'm saying that because it is such a um, relic in a way for booktube. I feel like people are talking about it, like the height of hype for the series was in 2015. I think I was very skeptical going in because the first few chapters are not particularly original or interesting in my opinion. It reeks of the dystopian uh, genre of that era, but it gets so much better. There are so many elements in this book that I'm in love with. I love first contact books. I love fantasy books uh, where I'm introduced to a new species or a whole new culture if it's humans. And this book took such a pleasant turn, because while it had a pretty simple concept when you really think about it, the water spiced it up with so many original elements, and I was very pleased with that. The story set in 2059, it's dystopian, and it follows a 19-year-old named Paige. She is a part of a mime order, which is basically a crime organization. This crime organizations are notorious and they only accept gifted people. The protagonist, Paige, is somewhat different and somewhat rare as this kinds of protagonists usually are. The world of Sion, where she lives, outlawed uh, people like her and uh, the only way for her to have sort of a life is to serve this mime lord. She does get into trouble pretty early into the book and is caught and sent to prison. She expects to be executed because that's what the government does uh, to people like her, but instead she is discovering what the world order is really like. It turns out that um, this whole time they were not told the whole story. The supernatural people are actually not imprisoned in the tower and executed later. They are brought to Oxford, which they believed is a contaminated area that no one lives in, and introduced to a different race named uh, Rephaim. Apparently this whole time people like her were transported to Oxford to uh, serve Rephaim and help them to fight these creatures named Buzzers. Paige is assigned to the Warden, who is a pretty mysterious figure. He is the Prince Consort to the queen of Raphaim and uh, she doesn't really know what to make of him because technically he is her enemy and she wants to get back to her home and to her work but also she acts very different from all the other Raphaim and she can't quite figure him out. This had so many twists and turns. Some of them were expected, some of them not so much. I really liked the descriptions of their powers. I really loved the magical system and the world building. I think it's incredibly interesting. And I very, very quickly 
got invested into the characters. There are so many of them and I think it's going to get even more interesting in the second book because we will finally see more of the mime order and every book that introduces a different creature, different race, different society is very interesting for me because that is the part of fantasy and sci-fi that I really really love. I think the genres are perfect for exploring our taboos and just a different way of life that maybe we can't visualize for ourselves. I love this kind of stuff and I've got it in this book, so I really liked it. And despite this novel being really, really thick, I think the chapters are just so perfectly executed. Every single one of them has a hook. You just want to continue reading it. I love this. I think I give it four stars just because the first part like the first two chapters were pretty slow and I was getting frustrated with them. But when I got through that, it was smooth sailing. I love this. Then I finished the series, which almost never happens on this channel. I've read As Good As Dead by Holly Jackson. Honestly, I just listened to the audiobook because I love the audiobooks of this series. I think they're just so well done. I don't know how to talk about this book without giving out spoilers, but I will try. It's the third and the last one in the series. I believe uh, Holly Jackson is not writing anything else in it, and it feels very final so i hope she's not going to prolong it because too much of a good thing is not good the story is about a girl named pip she's sort of like nancy drew but modern and uh, she in the first book was investigating a very um, controversial case as her summer assignment. One of the students in her high school was murdered and the police put it on the guy that was dating her and that killed himself after. They believed that he just felt so guilty, so he did it. Pip doesn't believe that it was him. She believes that the police didn't do uh, their work quite well and also that they were a bit lazy. So she takes it on herself to investigate it again. Look at it with fresh eyes. She's a teenager, so uh, most people don't take her seriously, including the policeman that investigated the case. But she teams up with the brother of the accused, and they find a lot of interesting things. This was the first book in the series, and it was very impressive. Usually in a thriller or crime series, you would expect the second and the third book to be a little bit worse. But honestly... It got better. I think it got better because of the transformation of uh, the Pip's character. She's such a bright idealist in the first book, but she has to investigate so much scary shit that she goes on a full arc as a character. It definitely affects her. And I loved seeing that. Because for me, then, these three novels felt like they had an overarching plot. Each had their own investigation, but at the same time, I knew these characters and I was invested in them. So I definitely think it's one of the most successful young adult mysteries that I've ever read. I've tried others. I feel like this one doesn't try to soften the cases up. It definitely talks about things that are a little bit more taboo. It's definitely not afraid to be a little bit more explicit and bloody, which I liked because I felt like it was authentic considering the situation. The next thing that I checked out was Galatea by Madeline Miller. It is one of her myth retellings. As far as I know, it's the only other thing that is published that she has in her repertoire. I've read The Song of Achilles, I've read Circe, loved both of them. And I also enjoyed this, even though it's very short and I would have liked to get a little bit more, but I guess she made herself clear in this, so why would I need more text? Sometimes I just want more because I want more and I can't explain it. Anyway, Galate is a myth about a woman that has been made from marble by a very talented sculptor. The myth doesn't spend much time analyzing Galate's motives or 
her point of view on the situation and uh, Madeline Miller as usually fills in. In the short story, Madeline Miller is trying to figure out how Galatea would feel about this arrangement. Galatea, who's been made of marble and humanized, made into a human, against her will, describes how off-putting her husband is to her, how now, when she is human, he's finding flaws in her, because when she was made from marble, she was perfect for him, she was something he could control, something that didn't have stretch marks and fine lines, something that uh, didn't have a mind of its own, and something that was obedient because she wasn't a person, she was an object. This was a very interesting uh, little story because what it talks about essentially is agency, and the obvious illusion is that some men would prefer women to be objects rather than humans because when they are objects, they can do whatever they want with them and they don't need any pushback. Madeline Miller always has a point of view. Her tastes are always interesting. I love all of her stuff. Now I can say that I loved all of her stuff because I've read all of her stuff. I'm interested what she's going to surprise us with next. In hopes of reaching my Goodreads goal or, you know, getting somewhere with it. I uh, then started uh, a reading blog of uh, romances. I thought I'm going to read so many books. I read three and I think it was a slower experience because I loved one of them, like really, really loved it. And I slogged through the other two because I really just liked one of them. And the third one was kind of okay. More of my opinions on the next three books in the reading vlog, I'm going to leave the link. Devon and Chris Plan a Wedding by Chances Higgins. It's about a dating reality TV show where people have to pretend to be affianced and plan their wedding. The challenge is to convince everyone that the wedding is real. Then at the end, at the wedding itself, they can decide if they want to follow through with it and get married or they want uh, to get the money. So it's really about deciding between money and love, if you actually develop this connection with a stranger. It would seem stupid at the first thought, but I do see the logic here, because on the first day when all the contestants met, the producers were carefully watching them and then deciding to pair them up with people that they actually have chemistry with and that they could see them falling in love with, so it would actually be a challenge. I liked the concept of this because I love reality TV shows, they are really something that I enjoy because I like human psychology and I like seeing them going through interesting experiences on screen, let's say that. I sound like a person with a god complex and also like a little bit of a sadist, but whatever. So the concept I liked, the characters I didn't like. My problem with this book, like the really, really big one, is that I really disliked Devon, which is one of the protagonists. She was just uh, very childish for a 30-year-old woman. I could not understand a lot of her motivation because she goes on that show and she's not out and she knows that she will have to come out to her parents on camera. I really find it hard to justify because it just seems like a stupid thing to do for me. I don't know, maybe other people will have a different opinion, but I was just turned off by this alone. Devon is incredibly irrational in general, she would get into fights with Chris, the other protagonist, for no reason. You know the stereotypical image of women that make up problems and then get offended? This was her. I don't think a lot of women, not girls, actually do this. It's okay to do this when you're young because you are still a little bit of a dum-dum, but when you're 30, I feel like that's a little bit too much. She honestly just annoyed me so much throughout this reading experience that it was really hard to convince me to like this book. It was really an uphill battle. Overall also, it felt like Chances Higgins doesn't know how to do conflict 
or is actively straying away from conflict because every single time the conflict was brewing, she was diffusing it. And I didn't really like that because romance in itself, the structure of a romance, is built on conflict. Something has to keep the couple apart at some point for the reader or the viewer or the consumer in general to root for them. And it, once again, was difficult to root for them because there was no conflict. Every single conflict that popped up was dissolved very quickly. The novel that I loved, was obsessed with, still am obsessed with, from that vlog is Requiem for Immortals by Lee Winter. It is about a woman named Natalia. She is a professional cellist by day and a professional assassin by night. She works for one of the Australian gangs. She's very good at her job until she is hired to kill a woman named Ryan. Ryan doesn't seem to be connected to any of the gangs, uh, to any of the famous flashy people, and she doesn't really understand the motive behind it. Uh, because it puzzles her so much, she decides not to kill Ryan right away. She decides to meet her and investigate it. And it is the biggest mistake in her career because when she actually meets Ryan and spends some time with her, she realizes that maybe she's not as cold-hearted as she wants to be. This book is incredible. If you like dark romance, but when it's not too dark, you're going to enjoy it. It's an assassin falling for her target, and I love that. There were so many things so many elements in this book that are my favorite. Natalia's point of view in general was so fun to read from for me personally because that's how I imagine Hannibal's point of view is like. Hannibal from NBC Hannibal. Natalia really is in love with her job. She has a god complex. She believes that she's better than anyone else. That she doesn't have any feelings for anyone, that she absolutely killed the empathy inside her, that she's basically a very well-trained machine and that she can get rid of absolutely anyone and not feel anything about it. She has all these peculiar hobbies and she's definitely very unique. I loved reading from her point of view. We have Ryan's point of view as well. It's not as extreme, but I liked her character as well. I think she complimented Natalia. In general, I loved, loved the romance in this book. And I loved the plot as well, but the romance was so good. If you're obsessed with Killing Eve, if you're still obsessed with it, even uh, after all the crimes that, that you decided to commit in the fourth season, you're going to enjoy this because this literally is the same dynamic. It's a very slow burn romance too. And I think Lee Winter did such a good job at keeping up the tension really high. It's now one of my all time favorite romances because I think that Lee Winter just tapped into something. I'm yet to read the tiny sequel, which is just a short story about their lives after this book. And I don't know why I'm prolonging this experience. Probably because I know that I'm not going to get more. And I would like to get more. It honestly is an indicator of a good book if you want more. As in, not more from it, but a sequel, a short little something, anything. What I really love about romances in general and... All of my favorite ones have that, is the level of vulnerability that the characters share with each other. If this element is not present, the book is just okay for me, because I don't feel other kind of romance. For me, the romance is truly real only when people are truly naked with each other in all ways, and I don't think all the romances that are published have that. Some of them are more shallow, more expected, and formulaic, and I don't really like that. This book 
is absolutely perfect for me. I loved it. And you're going to hear me talking about it for a long while because I really need more people to read it. The last book that I read for that vlog is Four Steps by Wendy Hudson. And I hoped it's going to be a darker woman's than it actually was. I read Requiem for Mortals prior to this. So beating that was very difficult, obviously. But if this book had more dark elements, I would have loved this more. It's about two women that meet uh, in the mountains while hiking, end up spending the night in the same cabin and fall in love with each other. One of them has never had a relationship with a woman before and actually just broke up with a long-term boyfriend with whom she was not getting along for some time now, but she didn't have the strength to cut him off. There is a background storyline uh, that is the dark element in this novel. Alex, who is one of the heroines, had experienced uh, something very traumatic as a child. Her family was murdered by a man who broke into their house. And she doesn't really know what exactly happened. And in the present timeline, uh, this same criminal comes back. You would think that with this premise, this book would have more suspense and darker elements and in general scenes uh, that would make your blood pump faster, but it doesn't really have that much of it. Most of the crime part of the story feels insignificant. It's mostly in the background and there's only one scene in the book where these two stories intertwine and I didn't really like that because from the premise I was expecting this to play a bigger role in the story and I personally think that it would have been a bit more interesting because otherwise it's just a regular story about two people meeting and falling in love and one of them not knowing if she wants to be in that relationship or not. So I was not particularly impressed with this story. I just would have loved it to be a little bit different. And I guess not all things are written for me. Some people probably enjoyed it more. I'm pretty sure of it. But I was just looking for something different. I moved on to historical romances after that. And I picked up something that I knew I'm going to enjoy. I decided to read The Governess Game by Tessa Dare. I occasionally just pick up Tessa Dare's books. It's not my goal to read all of her stuff, but I just know that she's going to make me happy. The Governess Game is the best book that I've read by Tessa Dare so far. I loved the first book in the series, and uh, before I read The Governess Game, it was my favorite, but now I have to say that The Governess Game is superior. It's just funnier. To me and I love when the order has a sense of humor because it just puts a smile on my face. I love listening to funny audiobooks. I love it when people look at me on the subway and when they're trying to figure out why I'm smiling like an idiot. I just love being happy. <laughs> Most people do, I think. This romance follows a woman named Alexandra. We met her before in the first book. She is a little bit of a bookworm. She meets a perfect gentleman in the bookshop. They bump into each other, lose their books. It's awkward. But at the end of this encounter, she still harbors romantic feelings about him and fantasizes about things going somewhere different. Time passes. She still sometimes thinks about this man. She is not a lady, so she has to make money by doing labor, and her job is actually fixing clocks. That's how she ends up at the same gentleman's house. One of his relatives dies and leaves him two little girls to take care of, and he doesn't know the first thing about 
children. When Alexander comes to his house to fix his clock, he mixes her up for a governess and he decides to interview her. Chase offers her the job, but she refuses and quickly runs off. She definitely recognized the guy. On her way home, she loses her equipment which means she no longer can um, fix clocks and she lost um, the way to make money. So she comes back, obviously, to take the governess position, even though she doesn't have any experience in this. What I really loved about this book, and you're going to be surprised because I don't really like kids in books, is the kids. I found these two girls so goddamn hilarious. I loved this part. I think they were such a good comedy relief. I also really like the moments, but honestly, I think I read Emma Fromances for different reasons. I just want them to be fun. If they're not fun, I'm out of here because I don't really care about the romance as much as another reader would care about it. Sometimes I do, but it's very rare. Either way, I found the scenario quite fun. I love the characters and I think that Tessa Dare just kills it with comedy relief which is very important for me in these types of uh, romances. The last book that I'm going to talk about is The Quick by Lauren Owen. It's a book that I found on a sale and that I've never heard anything about before. I just really enjoyed the cover and I read the back of it. The uh, description was very vague. I felt like it could be incredible or terrible because with that kind of description that is kind of ambiguous. It can be the night circus, which I hate because it's just vibes and no substance. This book surprised me because of how well structured it is and with how little I knew about this, it had so many elements that I love. This actually is a multiple point of view gothic novel about a secret society of vampires called Aegolius Club. If anyone just told me that, I would have picked this book up sooner. The first character that we meet and that I consider to be sort of the protagonist, but honestly there are a few protagonists here and they're telling the same story just in different periods of time, which is so interesting. I loved, loved how this was structured. I am a simp for good foreshadowing and for good unusual structure, so that's something that I just love. The first character that we meet is James Norbury. He and his sister are basically left to fend for themselves, even though they are titled their father left them at the care of the servants after their mother died. So he basically abandons his children. They basically don't have anyone else but each other. There are servants in the house, but they change and they don't particularly touch to these children. A few tragic things happen to both of them, but mostly to James at the start of the novel. It's all in the way of gothic fiction, but the children grow up and James decides to go to Oxford to get an education. But they continue talking to each other through letters. After completing his education, he decides to stay in London and uh, try his hand at being a writer. He rooms with a pretty eccentric guy and their relationship develops into something a bit more than friendship. That's when their problems start because that guy's family is not particularly accepting of that situation. And they, for the first time, are introduced to the members of the Aegolius Club. This story has a lot of point of views and you get caught at certain moments to get someone else's point of view. So you would see the story from a different angle. And I found this particularly interesting. I think some people would find this annoying, but I personally love that because the way this vampire society was structured was so fascinating to me. And I loved hearing about different elements of it uh, because every single character had their own point of view on this and um, they could 
tell me a little bit more. It is such an underappreciated novel in my opinion. I think I've heard about it only once on booktube, like seen someone hold it maybe, and I just think more people need to check it out. There are so many things in it that are absolutely and undeniably my thing. It is about vampires, it is about secret societies, it has a very interesting and usual structure. You get diary entries, you get a regular narration. In many ways, honestly, it reminded me of the interview with the vampire. The new TV show specifically, it had a vibe about it. The other thing that I really love in novels is seeing the character develop from early childhood to adulthood and just seeing how the things that happened to the characters in the past impact their future. This is one of the most satisfying uh, things about fiction for me in general. That's why when I was a teen I really loved fantasy novels because, because a lot of epic fantasies especially have that. I was just so impressed with this because I, I have not heard anything about it and it turned out to be such an interesting novel that is very, very tuned to my tastes. I actually had a physical copy of it but I was reading it on the plane and um, on my vacation in the hotel and I finished it there, so I decided to leave it in the hotel's library so other people would be able to find it and enjoy it. And I gotta say that I went to check if someone took it a few days later, and someone actually took it. So fingers crossed they enjoy it just the way I did. These are all the books that I managed to read in October and November. I know, not that many, and I'm very behind. We established that. Tell me how you're doing in regards to your Goodreads challenge. Maybe you can recommend me some short books because I do need them. I'm in a very dire situation. If you finished watching this video, leave a holiday themed emoji in the comments down below to support this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe and everything else. You know the drill. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it and I will see you soon with another one. But until then, bye.